Welcome back, geologists, for the second half of Triassic. So we learned about the plate tectonics of the Triassic period and understanding the importance of the first stage of the breakup of Pangaea is critical to realizing where specific types of organisms remains would be found in the fossil record. So think back to what happened with the Arb Soroka Sea and that it was regressing throughout the Triassic all the way to the early Jurassic. So if it's regressing off of the continent, only a handful of places will be conducive to finding marine fossils simply because of the presence of the sea was restricted. In addition, we had relatively exposed land masses all over the North American craton, which meant there was a high chance for probability of losing that rock due to erosion. With that in mind, that's one of the reasons that Triassic rocks are not as common as Jurassic and Cretaceous rocks, in which we had widespread deposition and good coverage above that. One more thing that's important to preserving rocks is typically to have some type of a cap rock on top of it. Most of the Triassic rocks are missing that, so we don't have as many of them as we do like late Cretaceous. And we'll see what I mean when we get to talking about the Morrison Formation and the cap rock of early Cretaceous that sits on top of that, and that's one of the reasons we have such great dinosaur bones. So let's start with the marine environment and just keep in the back of your mind that we didn't have full ocean coverage on the craton during the Triassic, quite the contrary. Just a portion of the western part of the continent really had any type of good marine coverage and that's soon to change as well. The early Triassic would be such a time of recovery from the worst mass extinction event of all geologic time that wiped out literally almost everything when it came to the marine environment. And we're talking 95-ish, 96% of everything went extinct, right? So that's a clock reset. It's basically let's hit the pause button, let's restart, and let's see how life flourishes. By the late Triassic, marine life had indeed recovered and started to fill those niches that were empty from the late Permian mass extinction event the great dying. So there is a fundamental difference between how we see the behaviors of Paleozoic invertebrates versus the marine invertebrates that we see in the Mesozoic. And here it is. First of all, we see them fill new niches that we haven't before. Besides the fact that we have many of the same animals that we had before, we're going to get a couple of introductions of new ones, and then we're going to see a rapid radiation in certain departments. Bivalves would be one of those. As we think about bivalves, I'd like you to think about where they come from, which is mollusk. Mollusks uh, have many different kinds, and bivalves are just one. A common occurrence throughout the Mesozoic were bivalves, gastropods, cephalopods, which are the three major subclasses that we think of when we look at fossil record and you see such a plethora of them throughout the Mesozoic. One very important life form in the ocean is going to evolve called sclerotinian corals. These are going to replace the rugosa and the tabulate corals that went extinct at the end of the Permian mass extinction event. So modern day corals are just versions of sclerotinian corals. And I'm not saying that the very animals that lived in the Triassic are with us today. I'm telling you that sclerotinian corals have been around for a long time, several hundred million years, and continue to thrive in their existence in the ocean in the right latitudes. So that's kind of an exciting event for the oceanic rocks. One area that I can point to that really had a behavior change was in the echinoid department. So echinoids are essentially sea urchins, and if you've ever seen a real sea urchin, you know they're spiny. They have uh, spines that are used for uh, various purposes. One, of course, would be protection, but they are filterers, and the way that sea urchins work today is they basically eat the sand and eat the uh, algae or material that coats that as a food resource. One of the things that changed for them starting in the Mesozoic was a really big shift from how they lived in the Paleozoic. They uh, changed their habitats. They didn't just exist in epifaunal. They also in 
burrowed, and that would be end faunal. That was a fairly remarkable change for organisms in this department. So if we're seeing them filling both niches, that's a pretty significant change in evolution habitat preferences for these particular organisms. So that will bring us to one of the big predators of the Triassic. There are three major groups of marine reptiles that live throughout the Mesozoic, and one kind of shines in each one of the periods, making it easy. And ichthyosaurs are the ones that were very common during the Triassic. It's not that we didn't have the other two types, and we'll learn about them in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods, respectively. Your book outlines their uh, lifespan as well. But ichthyosaurs were super common during this time frame. They look like a porpoise or even a dolphin. Don't be deceived, they're reptilian. And so they are not mammals. Now they were air-breathing reptiles, so ichthyosaurs actually came up to the surface of the water to gain oxygen and then would go back down. It is thought that ichthyosaurs actually gave birth to live young, much like a dolphin would today. So that's kind of an interesting deal. So what kind of shape and size were these things? These things range from just a couple of feet long to literally being a school bus size, you know, 45 feet long kind of animal. So they ranged in and had a big, uh, big variance of how they looked and how they operated. But these were all animals that were predatory, and these would be the types of things they would eat fish, things like ammonites. So they'd pick on the ammonites in some of the movies, if you've seen Walking with Dinosaurs, portrays them as uh, ammonite hunters. And I would suspect that's very true because we find remains in some of the stomach contents of ichthyosaurs in the fossil record with that very menu item on there. I would suspect that would have been a pretty yummy meal for them. And I'm sure any other type of marine animal that was available to them and even smaller ichthyosaurs would have been on their radar screen. So ichthyosaurs were marine reptiles. They are not dinosaurs. And I need to point out that when we're talking about marine reptiles, they are fundamentally a different build from dinosaurs who so do not class them in the same location because they're not. So the first flying reptiles appear during the Triassic known as pterosaurs, and they're going to exist all the way until the end of the Cretaceous where all flying reptiles went extinct. Don't judge all flying reptiles as being humongous because only a handful of them were. Most of them were the size of the average grackle or crow. So they were, they ranged in size from small little animals to ginormous. The biggest ones lived in the late Cretaceous, but nevertheless, these animals filled a niche that had not been filled before by reptiles. They figured out and adapted their bodies to be able to have flight in air. Now, I'm not saying that they could fly for long distances. That's still up for debate. But what I am saying is they had the ability to be an airborne. That's something that no other reptile has achieved. So when you look at this, they would need a few things in order for that to work. Most reptiles have pretty heavy bones. And so this was a big development to make some hollow bones and to create a lighter weight bones that would allow for less uh, mass to be able to stay airborne. They developed a membrane that was attached to their fourth finger. It's not a wing per se. I guess you could kind of call it that, but it's not the same as what we would call a bird wing because they're missing something very important that birds have, which is fused clavicles, which are used to attach muscular structures of the wing too. So that's one of the reasons that we know that they probably weren't long-term flyers. They just didn't have the perfect anatomy to do so, but they did a pretty darn good job with what they had. Another great development for pterosaurs was they had specific area of the brains that controlled muscular coordination and sight. When you look at fossils of pterosaurs, they have big eye sockets. That's a good indication of a predatory quality because big eye sockets are used to help spot prey. So these animals would have been smart. They would have been agile. They would have been fast. They would have been mobile. And you would need to be careful of these animals in the skies. 
So some of the movies portray them as horribly scary. I'm not saying that they were horribly scary, but I'm saying that they would have been smart animals and I would have been concerned by them. If I had the chance to go back in geologic past, I'd always keep an eye out on the skies during the Mesozoic. What is an archosaur? Well, an archosaur is just kind of a generic name for a specific group of reptiles of which kind of branched into two dimensions, and we'll look at them soon. Their name means ruling reptiles, but dinosaurs are a type of archosaur. We'll look at a handful of archosaurs today that weren't dinosaurs. But nevertheless, archosaurs are a group of diapsids, and diapsids have a single opening that's on each side of the skull in front of the eyes, which is the an orbital uh, fenestrate. So they basically have another opening right about here on their face. And that makes a really good important delineation, especially when we're looking at the two groups of dinosaurs. When you think of archosaurs, you need to realize that archosauria is simply a group that refers to the common ancestor of crocodiles and birds and all of their descendants. So archosaurs are subdivided into two basic clades, which are uh, groups of animals. So the first one is the Ornithosuchia, and this particular group includes the lineage of the birds and all of their related uh, animals, such as dinosaurs and pterosaurs, pterosaurs being flying reptiles that we just learned about. Pseudosuchia is the second clade that includes the lineage of crocodiles. So basically, archosaur is branched into two directions, the uh, lineage of birds and the lineage of crocodiles. Under the bird categories is where you'll find the dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And then under the crocodilian, you'll find things like uh, phytosaurs and adosaurs and other types of important animals that appeared that were non-dinosaurian. So they are missing a couple of important anatomy preferences that were developed in certain archosaurs that made them uh, dinosaurian. When we're looking at terrestrial life forms of reptiles, and various archosaurs, we need to take into account that they didn't all appear at once. A couple of things happened in the Triassic that are noteworthy. The first turtles appeared. Now you have to know that the turtles are the most armored of all animals on Earth, and they still are today. So it may seem like we would have a whole bunch of them in the fossil record. I'm not saying that we don't have them. I'm just saying that usually to preserve their shell, that's a pretty remarkable find when you get it. So a find like this would be a big deal. Having said that, turtles really haven't evolved much from where they came from in the Triassic. They're pretty much still the same body plan and the same basic shell armor covering. So they're kind of unique animals. Lizards came about during the Triassic by now. And we also, of course, have crocodiles. So don't confuse crocodiles with one of the animals we're fixing to learn about because they're two separate organisms sharing a very similar niche. So in paleoecology, one of the first things you really learn is that if you get two of the same kind of animal in the same place, they don't last very long. They kind of outcompete each other. That still applies in modern day time as well. So animals tend to fill different slots in their ecological uh, needs and habitat. So this particular archosaur is very famous for the Triassic because it first appeared and went extinct in the same geologic period and it's very restricted to its time frame of the Triassic. So I've spent time digging for adiosaurs, and adiosaurs are simply very much herbivorous types of animals that probably browsed along the shorelines of a river. That's At least that's what we think based on where we find their fossils. So when we go to the Mesa Lands dig site in Tucumcari for field course, this is one of the lucky strikes that we'll get when we find something. Sometimes it's an adosaur, and that's a big deal. So these guys look like they're very similar to Ankylosaurus, which is that very armored dinosaur of the late Cretaceous. Don't be deceived. They are in no way dinosaurian. So these guys are heavily armored like them, and they lived in the stream areas and stream beds. Their name means eagle lizard. If you kind of look at their mouth, they have teeth that are designed for stripping 
for example, leaves and twigs and that kind of thing off of plants, but in no way are they a predatory animal. So one of the common things we find in the fossil record of this particular animal are these things right here. So they're called armor plates, and armor plates are osteoderms. They're simply bony structures that grow, and the actual width, the length, and so forth can tell you where it went on the animal and actually help identify the species of the animal. So having found some of these in the fossil record myself, I'm pretty proud of any kind of armor plate you find, but certainly one of an adiosaur because it's a big deal. These guys went extinct at the end of the Triassic, never to be heard from again. Now, these guys right here look a lot like crocodiles, but they're not. They have a number of differences. First of all, uh, they are going, while they're related and under the same clade of crocodiles, they are morphologically different. Kind of neat history about the phytosaur. First of all, phyto means plant, right? So that's where it gets its name, plant lizard. And they were misnamed when they were originally described in scientific papers to be adopted as a species. And here's why. The first fossils that were discovered actually didn't have the teeth to go with them. They just had the sockets. And as you know, reptiles all have individual sockets for their teeth. While I'm here, I might uh, include that reptiles, when they lose their teeth, can regrow them. So unlike mammals who get a set amount of, of teeth, in the case of most mammals, that's two sets, very different for elephants. They get six sets. But nevertheless, uh, these reptiles will keep growing their teeth as they lose them. So that's the most common fossil find, like when we go to mesa lands, there's a phytosaur tooth. So when they found jaws that actually had the fangs attached to them, we're talking about fangs that are this long or longer. I mean, some of them are really impressive size. And we have several at the college that have been donated to us in our digs from these people. And it's a big deal when you find one because it's like, wow, those are so cool. And they have a serrated edge. Obviously, these were predators. They weren't plant eaters. Another neat thing about them is where their uh, nostrils are because when you think about where nostrils are on a crocodile, they're not in the same place as a pinosaur. So you get them way down here and then you see their eye sockets way up here and the morphology of their uh, brain casing is even different. So they're kind of a really interesting animal. They would have been fierce predators of their time during the late Triassic period and probably even had a couple of adiosaurs for lunch. Certainly would eat fish and any kind of thing that might cross the riverbeds or the swamp beds that they could chomp up for lunch. Phytosaurs ranged from just a few feet to literally multiple feet long. So this discovery may not look like a big deal. First of all, you're looking at this section right here of the animal. But this was discovered on the second dig year that we had out at Mesa Lands by Colin. And I introduced you to Colin in the first lecture series that we had on Triassic. Well, Colin and a group of guys were digging and they came across what was a small bone at that time. They uncovered just a small portion of it and realized they had found a very significant find. So they worked on the bone and essentially got it out. So Colin ended up doing an undergraduate research effort on this particular bone. And what's spectacular about it is, if I go back one, if you look at the phytosaur right here, you're basically looking at the part you're not seeing on this animal, which is down on this side right here. So you can see the snout from here to here looks like this, right? So what he's done is his project was all about putting some kind of scheme together or, or mechanism, really a, a way to measure the length of these skulls based on this part of the bone right here, which was actually ex brand new work. It was novel research, and that's what novel means. Nobody's done it before. So he... It looks like he's found like the second largest phytosaur to date in the world. And it's a pretty big deal because you're looking at a 
research project that changed the student's entire life. I mean, it basically turned him from being one major to a geology major, and his whole world's changed as a consequence of this one discovery, and the field of paleontology has changed for the study of phytosaurs simply because of this remarkable find. So obviously it's not the entire jaw, right? It's just this section right in here. So it's the mandible, and you're looking at this really remarkable, huge set of jaw bones, and the thing would have extended for much farther out. So basically what Colin did was put together a way to measure an estimate of size based on these particular bones. And it's this work's going to get published. It's a pretty big deal. All right, this was the apex predator of its time, Postosuchus. Postosuchus was a raw suchid. Nevertheless, this was a very important predator on land. This would have been the biggest, meanest guy around during the late Triassic. So this is an important guy. He got up to about 13 feet long. They were four feet tall at his hips back here at his tallest point, and he weighed about 660 pounds. So this is actually one that's on display at the Mesa Lands Dinosaur Museum in Tucumcari, and they bronze a lot of their fossil cast because they have a foundry there. So some of the fossils that I'll show you are bronzed, and that's why. Now, they're heavily armored as well. They had osteoderms, which seems to be a fairly uh, common characteristic of the animals of the late Triassic, at least in the uh, reptilian category that we look at for archosaurs. When you look at a postosuchus, uh, this is basically what an artist's depiction of him looks like, and this is a display at Mesa Lands. You can see he is pretty unique. I mean, he's actually got some evolutionary advances, but he's not the same as a dinosaur. He's missing one of the key things that we're going to see. He still walks better than some of our other uh, uh, archosaurs or pre-archosaurs that we've seen that are non-dinosaurian because he's got a, a little bit of benefit of how his hip fits into his socket that makes a big difference on how these reptiles will walk. So let's talk about something that's kind of controversial and when we talk about dinosaur life I need to point out that Eoraptor probably you need to be cautious about calling it a dinosaur first of all. There is a nearly complete three-foot-long skeleton of an early bipedal, and I'm going to quote-unquote say dinosaur, and this is Eoraptor lunesis, and it was discovered in Argentina. So what it has are some features that are dinosaurian and some that are not, bottom line. It has specialized features of some dinosaurs, like the big eye sockets and the opening right here in front of the eyes. It's got the sharp teeth, but it also has uh, other things that are similar to other archosaurs. So it's kind of almost transitional. It had a three-fingered hand, which is very common and close to th uh, theropods. So some people and in initial scientists thought it was a theropod. I think this is one that you need to hold off on calling a dinosaur for now. I think there's a lot more discussion to be had about Eoraptor down the line. But by the late Triassic, we know that archosaurs had evolved into what we will call true dinosaurs and radiated in types as dinosaurs. Now remember that evolution does not happen in one individual. It happens in a population. So it's kind of not correct to say that dinosaurs appeared all at once. I mean, it's not how it happened, not just they didn't just appear, they had a process of proceeding and evolutionary changes to become what we call dinosauria. So this one is a real dinosaur, Platyosaurus, and I bring this to light because not only was this the largest of the dinosaurs that lived in the late Triassic, it's kind of a special one. Um, this particular dinosaur was a sauropod, and as we get into our lectures over how do you identify the two different basic groups of dinosaurs, you'll realize that these are like the four-legged giant sauropods like Brachiosaurus or Diplodocus or Apatosaurus, except he's not that big and he also had the ability to kind of move around on two legs most of the sauropods would end up getting too big to where they would end up having to be quadrupedal 
He has five-fingered hands with a large thumb claw that probably was useful to him and how that he lived. His name means flat lizard, and I'm going to give you what their name means in every case of dinosaurs that we look at because that's pretty much how they were named. And the flat lizard has to do uh, with his vertebrae. Now, this sauropod got up to 27 feet long, which was ginormous for Triassic standards for any kind of dinosaur and weighed approximately 1,500 pounds, so not even a ton. So that may not sound, you're like, that sounds big. It's not big in comparison to what we're going to see in Jurassic and Cretaceous. But this was the, the biggest uh, type of dinosaur we had. This was not going to be a predator by any means. This was an herbivore. Now, Musaurus is named Mouse Lizard. I love this little guy. This was a little bitty sauropod on the other end of the spectrum. So as if I haven't mentioned it yet, sauropods are all herbivorous. None of them are predatory. This guy was no more than 10 feet long and weighed about 150 pounds max. So you're looking about a very long Labrador, but nevertheless about the size of a fully grown big dog. And so Musaurus is just endearing. It was one of the smallest and earlier sauropods that appeared, and it was definitely one that you would have expected to see during the Triassic. Now, no Triassic discussion of dinosaurs would be complete unless you talked about Coelophysis. If you look at this, you might mistake him for Velociraptor. Why? Coelophysis is definitely in the same basic family clade as the raptors. It is essentially a type of raptor. It was a theropod. These guys are about the same size as Velociraptor. Three feet tall, from tail to nose, they're about nine feet long, and pretty lightweight, 33 pounds. So we thought we had found a bone of a Coelophysis about the first year we had a dinosaur dig out at Mesa Lands, and I can remember Axel was so excited. He was like, oh, we found hollow bones. Well, it turned out to be a proto-dinosaur, so a, a pre-development of dinosaurs. But nevertheless, we, we might get lucky one day and find one of these. An interesting place to do a little research on is Ghost Ranch in New Mexico, where a whole bunch of coelophysis have been found in one location. They hunted in packs. They're unique in the fact that they would have been very important predators in the dinosaurian sense during their time frame. So their name means hollow form, and that comes from their hollow bones that they have. So coelophysis was a development of raptor-like uh, predators at the late Triassic. So sometimes there's a discussion, is there a new first bird besides Archaeopteryx? Archaeopteryx evolved in the Jurassic. We'll have a discussion about that animal when we get to that lesson. But Proto-Avis was featured in your textbook and it's worthy to talk about. So this guy found a very controversial fossil bottom line and he found it in late Triassic deposits of Texas of all places. Now, if it's a bird, it's going to have to have a couple of key elements to make it one. So if it ends up being a bird, that pushes the origins of birds by about 80 million years from the first known Archaeopteryx. And it would show the first birds lived at the first times of evolution of dinosaurs, which would be a major controversy because it's thought that uh, dinosaurs and birds have an evolutionary development one to the next, right? So these bones are not found with an articulated skeleton, and I think that's kind of a big deal to talk about in our discussions this week. We're looking at some of the challenges of how do you get bones out of the ground? And are the mistakes made in digging costly in the lab? What are things that need to happen for the skill sets of both types of people or both types of people appropriate to doing both types of work? And I think as we go through these discussions, you're going to have strong opinions about it. So I would say, first of all, that kind of sends a red flag up to me that the bones were not articulated. So that means they had to be pieced together. And oftentimes, having done a lot of digging myself, you don't know if you've got the same animal if the pieces are not together, which is what articulated means. In other words, the bones are still connected. And so you could be putting 
a variety of, of bones together and not even realize that that's happening. In good faith, they fit together, they look like they do, but they're really not from the same animal. So it's plausible to say that this particular fossil could come from more than one specimen. Now, this particular animal certainly has a couple of bird characteristics. It has bird-like feathered. Unfortunately, it was not on the lineage leading to modern birds. So this is just a, a fossil that I think we need more information. If more fossils of Proto-Avis are found, I think we can actually put some kind of a record to it that shows consistency. To find one fossil in the record does not make it a give me. And I'm going to give you a little story. I think I might have mentioned it earlier in the semester where some students planted a trilobite at the shale pit and a student that was in love with trilobites found it, and it was intentional. They wanted him to find it. It was a group of guys that had a lab uh, little group together, and you know he was swearing to me, you know he was exclaiming that, oh my goodness, the entire geologic time scale needs to be reworked because I found a trilobite in Cretaceous Days Rock. Finding one specimen is not enough. If we start to find trilobites in Cretaceous rock layers around the world uh, systematically, consistently, that changes everything. So to have one specimen and it's not articulated kind of leads me to having some questions. Not that I doubt the integrity of the digger at all. I would say having done digging, it would be very easy to find these bones, be very excited about it, and have what could be a transitional species. But there's just not enough information to make that assessment yet. So most of you in our discussions in the Paleozoic understood the significance that the next big evolutionary jump would be the development of mammals. While Cynodont is not a mammal, it definitely is where mammals evolved from, and there's lots of fossil evidence to support this. So the evolution of mammals from Cynodonts, and by the way, the name Cynodont means dog teeth, is so well documented that we can piece together a pretty remarkable story about how mammals evolved. There were some skeleton modifications that had to occur in order to transition from reptilian to mammalian. So these are going to take place in three major areas of the body. The middle ear of all places, not the first place you would guess, right, but essential for some of the reasons that mammals need a different inner ear. The lower jaw and then, of course, in their teeth. So we're going to look at it. This is an early cynodont right here. And let's uh, kind of talk about some of the differences that reptiles and mammals have in each of these three major parts of their body. While reptiles have one bone in their middle ear, mammals have three. And those bones are very important for uh, hearing. Reptiles have this part of their jaw that's hinged to the skull at a contact right there between the articular jawbone and the quadrate bones. Mammals have jaw bones that have the dentary contact to the quasmosal bone, and that's a different location altogether. When it comes to the teeth, Reptiles have teeth and sockets, and their teeth get replaced throughout their lifetime, while mammals are not the same. Most mammals have two sets of teeth. I didn't say all, but most do. And they have a baby set and adult set. Elephants are different. They get six sets, lucky them, right? But nevertheless, they also have a unique feature, all mammals, that they have grinding surfaces on their teeth, where reptiles or reptiles do not. So kind of a unique set of circumstances for those three areas of the differences between reptiles and mammals on the bodies themselves. Some cynodonts have a compound jaw joint that has characteristics of both articular and quadrate bones of reptiles, but also have the special dentary and bones of mammals. So that's kind of unique. They kind of share both sides of the story, again, looking at a transitional type of species. Their teeth are becoming double-rooted like mammals have, and they get two sets of teeth. They don't get their teeth replaced. So another characteristic that kind of leans towards the mammalian evolution. They have a partly divided um, 
occipital condyle. And so that's actually the protuberance that uh, comes in from the skull that fits into a socket at your first back vertebrae right here. And reptiles only have a single feature on that bone. But you're like, how do they know this stuff, really? So if you get to know a really good paleontologist, I mean, every speck of that bone helps identify what kind of animal, animal it is. It helps you narrow the scope of what you're looking at in the field. So having a pretty strong background in vertebrate paleontology is extremely imp important for any kind of paleontologist, even if you don't go into the field per se and you want to be somebody that's a non-professional paleontologist, you have to get self-taught on basic bone anatomy because you've got to know what you're seeing out in the field. Very much important in order to at least know what kind of animal you're looking at. So mammals, drumroll, evolved during the Triassic period and specifically the late Triassic. And of course their roots come from cynodonts. And they appeared shortly after our first dinosaurs appeared. Now, I guess mammals were kind of smart back then, maybe just because it was their first group. They were fairly small. Some got to the size of small rodents, but uh, nevertheless, they were not big. And throughout the Mesozoic, they make it a little bigger, like the size of a wolf up to that size. But other than that, most of them were pretty small. They retain some reptilian characteristics from their cynodont ancestors, like the jaw joints, but they had other mammalian features that had fully differentiated teeth, which made them very unique sets of organisms. Mammals are going to survive the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous and even at the end of the Triassic. They'll take a hard hit, but nevertheless, they'll overcome the uh, challenges set forth for them and they'll fill those niches in both uh, situations of mass extinction events. So we can't talk about anything on any period once we have life on land without having a discussion on plants. What was common during the Triassic? So I want you to think back to the petrified forest and think about the big giant conifer trees that we looked at. You would have seen cycads, conifers, and ferns would have been very common during the Triassic. And this is a good look at a landscape of what would have been present during that time. So Triassic was a time of recovery, a time of refilling those niches, and we'll see some remarkable stuff happen in the Jurassic period. So we've reached the fourth mass extinction Hall of Fame event. Something did go fully extinct during the Triassic, several things that are pretty noteworthy. In the marine department, conodonts. If you remember, conodonts were those small little teeth structures like from eel-like animals that we learned about in the Paleozoic, and they were very useful for biostratigraphy. Well, those guys went extinct at the end of the Triassic, and then we would have a near loss of up to 90% of bivalves and a serious hit of all the cephalopod animals like am ammonites and belmonites. So uh, we would also see decline numbers of brachiopods. Now we're going to see recovery of the cephalopods and bivalves and and sea urchins like echinoids throughout the remainder of the Mesozoic, so stay tuned for some pretty cool stuff with that. We would see some large uh, mammal-like reptiles, uh, such as the therapsids that we learned about in the late uh, Paleozoic, and then the kynodonts, certainly, that we learned about, large amphibians that existed in the rivers and swamps, the dinosaur groups like coelophyses, and then we would see the archosaurs from the croc crocodilian side, such as Let's just start this over. We are now to the Hall of Fame mass extinction event number four, which is the end of the Triassic. So we had a big extinction event at this time, and it killed off some important things on both land and in the ocean. Let's start with the ocean. It's going to kill off 100% of all conodonts, so no more conodonts for doing biostratigraphy to find oil. If you recall, those are the little eel-like animals that had teeth, those funny-looking shaped teeth that we learned about in the Paleozoic. We would lose up to 90% of bivalves and see a massive hit in the cephalopod and brachiopod populations. Now, cephalopods are going to kind of make a huge comeback in the Zuni transgression, so stay tuned for more on that. 
our mammal-like reptiles, which would be the kinodonts, take a serious hit. We're going to see archosaurs in general, whether they are dinosaurian or not, take a hit. So a couple of our crocodilian-like um, lineages, like adiosaurs and phytosaurs, go fully extinct forever. We're going to think that sea level is the major cause of this. This is uh, one of those mass extinctions that's still up for debate. But we do believe that they were contributing to the moraine extinctions as the Arbsaroka Sea was regressing off of the Craton. The sea level changes are thought to be associated with the start of volcanic rifting that occurred between Africa and North America. If you recall, by the late Triassic, we were actually starting to tear apart Pangaea. So by the end of the Triassic, we're going to have this widespread volcanism of which we have proof for, it's only going to last about half a million years, but we have this gigantic area that has this magmatic plume that surfaces underneath it called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. And that's today, as we would know, an area of a mid-oceanic ridge. As we separated the continents, it created a successful rift, which we now call an MOR. So as we finish up the Triassic, a couple of highlights for you. We know that Pangaea began to rip apart. So the entire Paleozoic was all about bringing Pangaea together, and the Mesozoic's all about tearing it apart. So as part of that tearing apart, we saw rifting, and the Palisade Sill is a really good clue to that. We also saw that as the Appalachians were eroding, they filled in a bunch of the basins from that rifting that was created as the land got pulled apart and filled the basins with sediments, thousands and thousands of feet of them called the Newark Group. On the southwest side of the Craton, we saw some really important rock layers like the Moen Kopi get deposited and the Shinarump conglomerate and of course the Chenley that we took a really close look at with all the members from the Petrified Forest. Important to note that the Petrified Forest was a very diverse a forest full of conifers and these trees were buried in a very unique situation with the help of our volcanoes from the Sonoma island arc that smashed into our craton as the Farallon began to subduct under North America during the Mesozoic. Also we saw a couple of first things. Corals of the modern day sense made their debut. We had rugosa corals and tabulate corals first appear in the Ordovician and then go extinct in the Permian and we get a replacement of corals in the Triassic period. So that's kind of a big deal. Echinoids start doing something pretty cool. They start burrowing, which is a new development and evolution for them. We would uh, lose a whole bunch of clams, like bivalves, by the end of the Triassic, but they did pretty well throughout the Triassic. Now we had our first marine reptile known as the ichthyosaur, and that looks like a porpoise or a uh, dolphin, but definitely a reptile nevertheless. Don't confuse it with the dinosaur. Pterosaurs made their debut for the first time, flying reptiles. Turtles hit the radar screen for the first time. Crocodiles first appeared. So a lot of first things came about during the development of archosaurs and the Triassic. So that's where the archosaur diversification was really important to dividing into two lineages where one would go with the bird side, one would go with the crocodilian side. We saw our first dinosaurs appear, appear and then probably a big drum roll moment is the first mammal. Unfortunate though, we would conclude with this big mass extinction event. Now that we completed the Triassic, it's time to take a break. When you come back, and we start our lessons for the next time where we'll be looking at the overview of how do you classify dinosaurs. Don't want to miss this one. It's important. And you'll be surprised on the stuff that you're going to learn as we go through this process. See you at the next lecture. Bye.